Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy Dowling. I play bass in the Australian Metal Band Lord. And if you didn't know, I also host the Self Starter Podcast because one podcast is clearly not enough. If you're into freelancing, self-employment or small business, you can go to selfstarter.com.au and go and give it a crack. And I must say a big thank you to everybody from the Andy Social team, the Andy Social crew that have jumped on over there and helped me launch that podcast and support it in the first few months of it being up and running because it's um, it's something that I'm very passionate about. It's a really, really cool topic. It's something that I'm doing myself, uh, going through that self-employment journey. And uh, it's really, really cool to see so many people support this podcast and blog. So get on get on over there to selfstarter.com.au and go and give it a crack. Now, speaking of thank yous, because I can never stop saying thank you enough, keeping in line with my commitment for 2018 for this podcast, I am doing weekly shout outs, weekly thank yous to people that support this podcast. So this week, a massive shout out, massive thank you to Christine Hayes from Sydney, who's been supporting this podcast for quite some time. Thank you so much. I know you've been listening for quite some time and I know that you've left a very, very cool Facebook review over on my Andy social Facebook page. So Thank you. How many times can I say thank you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please go and send me a message on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter with your address and I will flick you out a fresh, brand new, hip, cool Lord patch in the post because we all love getting things in the post. So make sure you shoot me a message and I'll get that out to you ASAP. And you know what? While I think about it, maybe I should get some Andy social patches. I might, I might just do that because I know a few of you guys wear battle jackets. I know I've got a few crusty punks that have the old Hessian uh, bags that you you wove, wove, you wove, you sew your woven patches onto. Anyway, God, I'll just leave it at that. I might get some patches. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. All right, so this week's guest is with Peter Hodgson. Now, Peter, I have admired for quite some time. He is living the dream. He is somebody that is heavily immersed in the music world. He's a music journalist. He's also the social media manager for Seymour Duncan Pickups. He has just been a part of the music industry for quite some time. He's been playing guitar since he was, I think, something like eight years old, eight or nine years old. And uh, he's done everything. He's been a guitar teacher. Um, he runs his own blog called I Heart Guitars. You can go to iheartguitarblog.com. I believe that's what it is. And um, I have all the links over at adysocial.net. So go over there and check it out. Um, there's lots of cool things and some cool videos, including one one of him jamming on stage with Joe Satriani. So make sure you go and check that out. But um, Peter's just a really, really cool guy. He has been, as I said, a part of the music industry for quite some time. We spent a lot of time talking about, um, well, I just gush about the fact that he goes to NAMM every year and he's been going there for the past nine years. Um, it's just one of those places I'd love to go myself. So I spent a bit of time just gushing about that. So please excuse that. Um, but we'd spent a lot of time talking about I guess his origins in music, how he got started, his first job and sort of networking and finding his feet, uh, playing guitar and also being a music journo. And we also touch base on, I guess, some mental health stuff as well. Um, you know, him working through depression, working through anxiety and some challenges that he's had along the way and how he's got through some of those uh, down periods in his life. And it's a really, really interesting and important conversation that I think a lot of people don't talk about. So, and I think it's something that we should all be talking about more often. And I think from my end, I have a bit of a responsibility to talk about this more often with people because um, we all know people that suffer. And uh, unfortunately, I think we've all been touched by people that uh, are no longer with us for um, many reasons that I think we could all um, well, I don't know how you put it. We could probably all have some form of impact and help uh, avoid. So uh, very important conversations to be had. And uh, we certainly touch on that topic in this episode, which is really, really cool. And uh, I think a lot of people will get some value out of this. So if you want to support Peter, as always, with every guest on the Andy Social Podcast, you can get, a, get, on, get on over. Once again, to andysocial.net, check out the show notes for this episode, go and give it a crack, uh, reach out to Peter, make sure you let him know what you think. I am struggling through this. I can't even string a sentence together. Let's just cut it there. All right, guys, please enjoy this episode with the legend, Mr. Peter Hodgson. How's things? Yeah, good. Just uh, settling in post-NAM, like the, uh, the jet lag has kind of worn off and I finished all my articles about it and yeah 
I've just been um, skimping through. I don't know if skimping's the right word, but I've been going through a bunch of your photos um, just yeah. from the last uh, few weeks being in the US, and um, I'd, I'd seen a few popping up in my feed while you're over there. But um, mm. my jaw dropped when uh, there's a few certain people that you're in photos with. Um, one being Paul Stanley. I'm like, oh. Yeah, that's not bad. Just someone casually just walking around. Just uh, why not get a photo with him? <laughs> but I know. No, it was <laughs> it was totally cool because you know I do Seymour Duncan social media, and I was sitting there at the booth just you know working on a post on my phone or something, and this guy comes up and says, "Hey, uh, I represent Paul Stanley, and he's over at Ibanez right now, and he'd like to come and meet Seymour. Can you help us make it happen?" And I'm like, "Okay," <laughs> and so like. <laughs> Three minutes later, Paul Stanley walks into our little lunch room where we just go and, you know, chuck sandwiches down our throat, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the show. And um, he couldn't have been nicer. Like, he was so cool. And, you know, just kind of, you know, he was as excited about meeting uh, Seymour as, you know, people are about meeting Paul Stanley. <laughs> That's pretty cool. What, what's He hasn't been using Seymour Duncans or he always has? Or? Oh, no. He's... he's always used them yeah. um yeah he just wanted to drop by and say hi and you know i'm not sure if he's met seymour before i think this was the first time he met him so um but yeah he's used them for years and years that's pretty cool um oh, it's good to see uh, somebody still hustling after all these years and making sure that uh his networking is up to speed good stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> it's um i mean i'm just going through some of those photos from that trip and i've always been in awe of people that go to NAM, I just think it's like, it's like this magical land. Like some people go to the US or other parts of the world to see like places like Disneyland and Disney World and all these amazing theme parks. And I think NAM's like the, the music musician equivalent of like the, the greatest theme park of all time, where you've got just every, every amazing brand and, and instrument and even musician and artist and, and people that work within the industry all under the, the one gigantic roof. And it's just this incredible thing. And I just sit there every year going, Oh, I'd love to just go. I should just go there and just hang around in the corner of the of the whole hall and just watch everybody go by. It just looks so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that, but it's really funny because the first time you go, it's like totally overwhelming and you realize that like every rock star you've ever heard of is just walking around because it's, you know, close to the public, they can kind of relax and it's like, Oh, there's Rob from Metallica just walking around looking at bases or whatever. <laughs> But then after you've been a few times, it's like, oh, great. Steve Vai's here. So he's clogging the aisle with all the people around and trying to get autographs. <laughs> and like, I'm the biggest Steve Vai fan in the world, but I purposely now like make sure that I know when he's going to be there. So I know which, which areas to avoid because it's going to be chaos. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I've got, I've got work to do. I can't like lurk around trying to, you know, hang out with my favorite player. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, you've got another purpose of being there. So, um, you know, uh, you've got to prioritize um, those reasons and, and yeah. no doubt that sort of helps uh, get past uh, some of that, uh, some of that distraction. Yeah. It's really funny though, because usually it's the show itself can be so intense. There's like 90,000, a hundred thousand people there. And it's not until you kind of look back at it when you get home that it kind of sinks in. Like I did what? <laughs> I, I met who? <laughs> you kind of have your own quiet little freak out moment. It's, um, yeah, it just seems like this, this absolute wonderland when it comes to just, I guess, anybody that's got any interest in music or is just even, even somebody that's not a musician, just being a fan of music in general, just to, to see a, a place that exists in the world where so many people congregate together and, and share best practices and share what they do and what they love. And it's just, uh, it seems like this amazing place. Yeah. And even if you can't, you know, get in, you know, get a pass or anything, there are so many concerts that are open to the public, you know, in the area kind of around them, that like you can still kind of be a part of it, uh, you know, in a way. And like the, um, the shows are just insane. Like there's like the Randy Rhodes remembered and the Bonzo bash where like all your favorite guitarists or drummers are there paying tribute to Randy Rhodes or John Bonham. Um, I finally got to see extreme for the first time. I saw because they That's were cool. playing just down the road and, um, you know, there are all sorts of things. There's the bass bash where, like, years ago I saw the Aristocrats play their first show before they even had a name. Wow. <laughs> um, it was just the, you know, it was just those three guys playing two of their solo songs each. Um, and, you know, it went so well that they were like, geez, we've got to keep doing this. And, you know, <laughs> just the gigs that you can stumble across by accident, it's 
it's incredible. It's just this melting pot of activity where, I guess, as you said, like that, that's a perfect example of it's, um, you know, what better place to try an experiment, something that's different with, um, you know, people that you've associated with in the industry and see whether, you know, the crowd is receptive of it and what better pl- marketplace to, to try that out as, as um, you know, an event around them. Yeah. And also as a networking opportunity, it's yeah. nuts because like I firmly believe that it's, it's not about, you know, you people say, you hear people say it's not what you know, it's who you know. That's true to an extent, but you've still got to back it up. Mm. You've still got to have the skills to do whatever the job is. But it's if you if you network and you know how to get yourself out there and you make friends with the right people, then if you're the right person, you're the first one they're going to think of. If they get to you know submissions for a, a writing job or whatever, and they're both equally capable, but there's one of them that they know like. I've hung out with this guy. I've got a sense of who they are as a person. They're probably more likely to pick you. So, like, it's just the networking from being there, being at the gigs, you know, just letting shit happen. <laughs> you know, it's, it's insane the kind of opp- opportunities you can you can stumble into. Do you find that with, with ne- networking, because a lot of people get confused about it, and for me, I've always seen myself as a reasonably decent networker as far as, you know, from the band perspective and always going around and making sure that I'm sociable with people and meeting people and making sure that um, I'm giving the best face of the band possible when I'm, when I'm talking in, in light of what we do. And, and um, I think a lot of people make it too c- complex as far as the way that they mm. approach it. And I think a lot of it is just rapport building and just building a connection with people and not actually doing the hard sell and saying, oh, I do this and, and I've got this and maybe we can do this. It's instead just saying hello and that's that can be as simple as that. And it's usually later on down the track when things op- open up, like you said, um, where people will then keep you in mind instead of you just going in for the hard sell straight away. Exactly. I mean, in this industry, everyone plays. If you're at NAM, you're probably good <laughs> you know you're, you're there for a reason yeah. um and you know as a musician you know when you're good you know when you're ready um and so a lot of the time the networking that goes on at nam really is just like let's what else are you into you know let's talk about this and that and you know just getting to know people because you know that they've got the good it's more like just building those human connections and you know it's um some of the conversations I've had with people at NAM have had nothing to do with music, but they've gone on to become great friends and they've gone on to recommend me for jobs and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it's all very honest. Like, it doesn't feel like you're networking to get something. It feels like you're networking because you're there, you're part of the, part of the industry and it's just what you do. And, it, you know, if it, anyone listening to this, like any opportunity you can get to go to this thing, like totally do it because it's just so much easier for people when, once they've put a face to a name to, you know, to call on you when they need something that you can provide. Well, as you said, everybody's there. Everybody's already achieved something or has done something to get themselves into that spot anyway. So they've gone through a degree of hard yards to, to get to that, that point. So really it's more or less, as you said, just building those connections with people. And then if opportunities arise later on, it's more, it's more about, do I get along with this person? Do I have a connection with this person? Is there something that I can see in that person that I've got some kind of, uh, I guess, you know, uh, a common, some common ground, not just out of, I guess, the music or the technicality of the industry or whatever we both share. It's, it's those personable things that, uh, that solidify any sort of opportunities later on down the track. And, you know, you've already gone through all that sort of testing, testing phase of proving yourself and, and uh, putting in all those hard yards to begin with. Yeah. And I mean, like musicians, I think we all tend to have a little bit of insecurity about ourselves. We're all kind of outsiders in a way. Um, And NAM is where you find all your fellow outsiders. (laughs) And, you know, we may be social misfits in our own little ways, but, you know, once you kind of find yourself there, you find other people like you. And, you know, it's just, I think it does a great thing for your confidence to go over there and find so many people who are you know, in your same world, you know? Yeah, I think... um I think I I have to find a way to sneak in one year. I, I've just got to I got to get in there, even if I just sit in the corner and just watch everybody go by. It just seems like, it seems like a, such a cool place. How many years have you been going there? This was my ninth. 
Wow. At nine, nine consecutive years? Yeah. Yeah, impressive. Impressive. And is it, I mean, obviously there's, you're, you're working and you're representing a brand when you when you go over there, but um, I assume that that same level of excitement and, and energy is, is just as much there as it is from the first few times that you went there? Um, it does change. Like you do kind of start to get into the routine of things a bit and it makes it easier. Uh, um, the first couple of times you go, it just zooms by in a flash because it's so like overwhelming. Like, you know, <laughs> the, the noise is insane. Mm. Um, people everywhere. You can have a hard time finding the booths and stuff. If you've got appointments to get to, it can be really hard to get from one end of the convention center to the other. But, um, you know, after a while, you kind of develop your mental shortcuts to deal with all that stuff. And um, then it really just becomes like summer camp, <laughs> you know, even though you're working and stuff, you've got your NAM. I, I call it my NAM squad. Every year you kind of build your NAM squad bigger and bigger. You get more people that you kind of catch up with the next year. And, you know, it's kind of like I'm a busy guy. I'm a dad. It's like I pack all my social life into, <laughs> into that one week yeah. for the year. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's really, really cool. Uh, it's just, um, I, I think just from the perspective of, and I'm going to get to this in a moment as well with, I guess, how long you've been sort of working in the industry and working around just, I guess, the guitar in general and, and playing guitar from such an early age. When I look from when I first started playing guitar and idolizing just anybody, like people that just work behind a counter at a music store and got to play with guitars all day or, or sell guitars and just show people guitars. And I just thought that's the most amazing thing in the world. And then gradually over the years, you know, start to play in bands and, and be around more and more people. But what you do, and I've watched from afar for, for quite, a, quite a while now, it's, I, I get that, uh, the 14 year old me, I get these little you know, goosebumps and I go, oh, that's, that was like when I was 14, that was like what I would want to do. That's like the sort of scene. It's the people that you'd want to be around. And from what I see, like you working with Seymour Duncan and also doing all your music journalism as well and having your own blog, you're pretty much touching base on every aspect of your life from what I can see. And it's all in music. And it's just this amazing thing to look from the outside looking in. Yeah, well, I, I think back to when I was a kid and same thing, I would see people working at the music store and like, they were my heroes because they knew everything, <laughs> you yeah, know, they, they, like they got an overview of what people were playing and you, you knew that they were all in bands themselves and stuff. Um, as much as it was important for me to have heroes to look up to, like, you know, Mark Knopfler and Steve Vai and stuff. Mm. It's always the local people who, you know, you can actually bounce ideas off, you know, that make such a difference. Like, you know, I don't know anyone who discovered Hendrix by themselves. They always discovered Hendrix because some cooler kid was like, dude, I think you'd get this. <laughs> <laughs> and they induct you into it, you know. Yeah. And music, music stores even, you know, still now are a great place for that. Absolutely. And I, I, I remember that. I mean, I think Hendrix is either, either my dad sort of threw the name out there in passing and not really being a massive Hendrix fan, but just knowing that that was, that was a guitar idol, or I might've seen a poster in like an, an Alan's music or something when I was first getting like my first guitar or something along those lines and just uh, going, who is that crazy looking person? Then realizing, oh, that's from decades ago <laughs> and going mm -hmm. and then going back. But you always, exactly what you said, you would look up to these people that you walk, you walk into a store, you walk, like music shop, like even if it's just, you know, selling CDs and records and, and all of that. And you sort of, idolize the locals because they're just so much cooler. They know all these things and you just look at them and go, I want to be at least what you're doing, <laughs> if not more. And um, it's well, that's really it. like deep down. I've just always wanted to be that guy that, <laughs> you know, that other people come to and, you know, what should I listen to? What, what should I play? What guitar should I get? And so pretty much everything I do is just based around that. Like it's always just been whatever knowledge I've been able to, accrue over the years of playing and reading and working and stuff, you know, it's all to pass on. Like I don't, I'm not here to keep it to myself and to share it because I know how important it was for me to, to have people do that. So if someone hits me up out of the blue and it's like, dude, um, you know, what pickup should I get? What guitar should I get? You know, I love that stuff. <laughs> you know, I just, yes, this is my chance. <laughs> well, you, you've, you've been playing guitar since you're eight years old. But mm -hmm. what was what was your first actual job? 
Um, my first job was actually restoring pianos at a music store. Um, uh, it was called London Music in Albury, and the um, the owner played keyboards for Phil Emanuel. And um, so, like, Phil would come in and I would kind of drill his brain and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> ask him for some tips and stuff. But um, my main job there was just to, um, like, remove the old pads off, like, piano keys and, like, glue on new ones and stuff because they were just, yeah, they, they sold pianos, but their main job, um, my main job there was, you know, helping to restore pianos. And um, that was cool, just being surrounded by musicians and stuff and hearing all the stories and everything, you know. So that was my first job. And then not long after that, I worked for over the summer at um, uh, World of Music. There's still a World of Music store in Melbourne, in uh, Brighton. Um, but I worked for the Albury store, just, you know, dusting guitars and lugging boxes and <laughs> tuning guitars and all that stuff. And, um, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. And again, it was just being around people who were obsessed with music and kind of learning from them and going from there. How did, how did you get those first two jobs? So, you know, going, especially for, for a first job for so many kids, I just remember when I was trying to get a job and just being so gun shy and not knowing whether I was even good enough for somebody to, to pay me money to do anything. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, most of my friends would be getting a job at Kmart or something like that. Uh, but to get a, mu a job in a music store doing anything, you know, taking out the garbage or anything like that, it would be like this dream job. So how did, how did that all come about, just getting that first one? Well, the London Music one started because, um, well, I met the, the owner because he was playing for Phil and I would just go to wherever Phil was playing, like if he was in town. Um, and so I got to know him through that. And then it started with work experience through high school. And then they just asked me to stay on for a, a little bit. And I couldn't really... Um, you know, I couldn't really do it as a full-time job. I was still at school. But, um, yeah, so that just came about because I met those guys and, like, I was incredibly shy, <laughs> especially as a, you know, 16-year-old. But, um, you know, I just kind of applied for work experience there and they were like, yeah, we already know that guy. So it's like, they're working at work. <laughs> um, and then the world of music job came because I used to go into that store all the time and shred up the storm, you know, get a little audience around me. You know? And, um, you know, they knew that I knew my stuff. And so even though it was just the basic kind of, you know, like you said, taking out the trash and all that, you know, it, it was kind of, you know, inducting me into that world. And so they, they offered me the job, you know, I think they one day and the boss was like, Hey, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to do this. And I was so shy that I was just like, yeah, that sounds cool. And I'm just kind of looking at guitars to distract myself. And then my dad was, afterwards was like, you know, he just offered you a job, yeah? Like, yeah. <laughs> I was so shy. <laughs> was there anything that you learnt in those first couple of jobs? Because I, I just remember when, because I did, I did some work experience in a job. Um, I was growing up in Redcliffe in Queensland and I worked in a local music store and I did Thursday afternoons. I had this like work experience program in high school and Thursday afternoons you could go out and, and do some work experience for a few hours. And I worked in this, I don't even know, I can't remember the name of this place, but it was this tiny, tiny little store. And uh, the guy who ran the store was just so laid back and chilled that I didn't really learn anything whatsoever, but I just loved walking around the store and trying to look busy. And, um, but I just realized that there was a different sort of culture around, um, I guess being around musicians and being around sort of music industry people and their not so much the the laid back aspect but understanding that when you had to work you had to work and mm. and in between you would you you'd find other things to do but it was just a different vibe altogether as opposed to just a stock standard job and I guess for you you, ne you probably didn't have a lot of experience at that stage in any other sort of environment but did you find there was anything sort of unique working in those first two jobs that sort of opened your eyes to how the world was working, especially in sort of that music industry? Yeah, definitely, especially at World of Music. Um, I really got the sense just from observing how the owner, Brad Martin, kind of, you know, sold guitars and stuff. Like, he seemed to see it as, yeah, it's a business and you want to make as much profit as you can, but sometimes the best way to do that is to, you know, give people great discounts and make them a repeat customer and make them part of the culture of the store. But ultimately, you want to sell people the right guitar for them. And, you know, for the sake of the business, you might want to make the best, you know, <laughs> the most amount of money off it that you can. 
But if the right guitar for someone is something, you know, inexpensive, um, that's the guitar you sell them. Like, you, you find out what they want to play, which is really important. You see so many parents come in and shop on price, and it's like, no, you, <laughs> you don't want to get a kid a nylon string guitar when they want to play Metallica. <laughs> you know? um, so this will get you, uh, you know, get, get them as close as they can in your price range and make them happy and make them want to stick with it. Yeah. Because if they try and play what they want to play and don't hear what they want to hear, they're going to be discouraged. So, um, yeah, the main thing I learned from that experience was just making sure that whatever someone's budget is, you get them the gear that makes them, uh, well, a repeat customer, but a lifelong musician. Mm. Did, um, I think, uh, actually, go, going back to, I guess, my comparison of that is... Um, walking into into Alan's music with my dad and my dad was a big sort of John Denver, Paul Simon, Simon and Garfunkel, um, James Taylor, that sort of era of music. And he had this beautiful old uh, Ibanez acoustic guitar that he bought in New Zealand back in the seventies. And that was what I learned a little bit of guitar on and some Beatles songs and, and all of that. And, uh, but I discovered Metallica and, I just could not, apart from a couple of, you know, maybe nothing else matters, just playing these open strings. Um, apart mm-hmm. from that, I was just, I, I, I couldn't do anything with this guitar. And so he took me to Alan's music. And um, I remember there was this long haired young guy who um, I felt very intimidated by because he was just so much cooler than me. And I was still trying to grow my hair <laughs> out. And, yeah. um, and so he's walking around showing a bunch of guitars. And I remember there was like Jackson's and Ibanez and, and all the, and Gibson and looking at all these amazing guitars. And dad's like, yeah, they're a little bit pricey. And so uh, I end up compromising and getting a Proax guitar with a Park uh, practice amp, a little 10 yeah. watt amp. And, uh, but, you know, it did the job and it kept me going. And, and 100% what you said, if, uh, if Dad sort of stuck to his guns and said, no, well, nah, I don't think um, I can, we can go down the electric guitar path just yet, we'll get you your own acoustic. I don't know whether the longevity would have been there, whether I would have stuck with it. So, uh, mm. it's, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Do you find that with... Um, I guess back then and since then, that moment where somebody buys their guitar for the first time, their first ever guitar, do you see that there's a, I'm trying to think of the best way of wording this, but I just compare it to somebody buying their first ever car or their first ever home. And it's such a defining moment in their life where, you know, it's not so much just about the money, but it's just this achievement in life where they tick that box and they say, I've I've worked hard and I've got to this point. Did you see those sort of moments when you're sort of starting out working in music stores where kids would come in or somebody would come in and just throw the money down and go, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot and try and get that first guitar and, and seeing that sort of moment where somebody's suddenly opened their eyes up to this whole new world? You know what, the, you know what it is, exactly is? It's Obi-Wan handing the lightsaber to Luke Skywalker <laughs> and Luke turning it on. And Obi-Wan's explaining what it does, but Luke's just kind of wide-eyed, like, swishing it around. And, like, you know, it, it's that moment. It's, it's giving someone their lightsaber, and they don't know how to use it yet, but you can, you know, impart some of the significance of it, uh, you know, on them. And then they go off on this journey and, you know, <laughs> use it how they're going to use it. Um, yeah, it's totally that. And, like, I, I still see it like that whenever I get a new guitar. It's like, oh, the possibilities in this thing, you know, um, I think of it in terms of the music I'm going to make on it or the, um, you know, emotions it's going to evoke. Um, like, you know, I have synesthesia. So whenever I, you know, say hear a sound, I kind of get this mental resonance of like colors or numbers or flavors or textures or Mm. all sorts of different stuff, you know, based off whatever that trigger is. Um, so what I do now is specifically, I will choose guitars based on, what I think they will evoke in me emotionally because ultimately that's what music should be is it should just be a um an audible representation of whatever you're thinking or feeling so um for instance my newest guitar is a uh, Kiesel Veda and um you know I picked out all the specs and the colors and stuff and everything was like extensively selected because of like okay, this is the color blue that I sometimes see in my dreams of the ocean and I want the neck to feel this way because it's, you know, I want the neck to feel like a piece of wood instead of, you know, slick and, you know, glossy because I want to feel that connection to to it and always remember that this used to be a tree and, you know, and everything, like every aspect of that guitar was chosen based on something I wanted it to evoke emotionally so that when I listen back, it's not just, you know, 
his guitar playing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's almost like this, uh, this aid or this tool that's helping unlock something that you previously haven't been able to unlock in the right way. And it's, just, it's mm. a special device that will, will help you sort of get that out, out of, out of you. Yeah. I mean, a big thing for me was, um, like everything is connected. Like if I see an album cover and I listen to the album, that album sounds like that color to me because I've already associated it with it. Um, if I think of the guitar tone in No Rain by Blind Melon, that's yellow and white because there's a yellow and white strat there. Um, <laughs> you know, it's kind of already putting that, that, you know, that um, trigger in there for me. But I mean, the funny thing about synesthesia is sometimes your brain will like create its own colors that clash with things all together. And, you know, <laughs> so you, you can't always rely on that, but sometimes, you know, seeing something, an album cover or a guitar color can like already like give you an idea about how to feel about that, that piece of music or that guitar. Um, well, definitely. I know that I have a few, um, pretty similar guitars. I've got like two Ibanez RG 550s and basically the only difference is the color, but I play totally different things on each of them. You know, one's black and one's road flare red. <laughs> and, um, you know, I do feel like I play more kind of glitzy on the, on the neon red one compared <laughs> to the black one. Well, I guess, I mean, this probably just emphasizes how important it is for, you know, talking about music in particular, but probably anything where presentation and the way that something, yeah, the way something's presented is so important and can be just as important as what the contents of that thing is as well. So, you know, when you look at something, you're getting some sort of feeling or some sort of vibe from, from it. And you might be surprised and it might not completely link up, but it's, it's trying to set the tone. It's setting expectations before you dive in of what, uh, what you're about to, to listen to. And, and one thing that I've just hated over the last probably decade or probably the last probably 15, 20 years, uh, with all the CGI stuff, especially with metal albums and this just God awful <laughs> metal album covers that have come out where people have just taken, I guess the shortcut with, uh, because they've just haven't put the, I guess the care into it like they used to probably decades ago. And, um, I think it's really sort of let down a lot of music and it probably has cheapened a lot of music, at least for me, because I, I look at this really sort of simplistic and not in a good way, this really simplistic and shortcutted, um, artwork that I just think they've just slapped together in an afternoon because I've run out of time. And then I take that same approach when I listen to the music, cause I've already sort of set my expectations. So it's, it's from a different perspective to what you just mentioned with, you know, the two comparison guitars, but I just, the importance of color and image and just the way that things are presented, it's, you know, people say, well, you know, the music's the most important thing, but you, it has to be complemented by something else. Yeah, it's all part of the same creative expression. And I feel like, um, I think back to a lot of records in the 90s had, like early 90s especially, had great covers that there was like some kind of a movement where the cheesy album covers of the 80s had kind of gone out. And instead it was like, you know, you would see a lot of grainy photos that were maybe just like really abstract or something like that. Um, and it just seemed evocative, you know? It seemed like you were stepping into a world and the, the the album cover was the door and, you know, in you go. And, like, I miss, like, album artwork and, you know, booklets and all that stuff. Like, still buy as many CDs as I can, but you don't get that experience on, like, Spotify where you kind of, every page is laid out in, the, you know, a, a consistent way with the cover and you can just kind of pop on the headphones and just go into it, you know? I kind of missed that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm going through a process now where I'm moving on from a lot of my tangible music items, like a lot of vinyl and CDs, and I'm keeping a lot of stuff, but I'm just sort of, I guess, shedding excess weight. But I'm looking through a lot of this stuff and then remembering why I got into that album or that song in the first place. And it wasn't just about the music, but it was the music highlighted around you know, the imagery and everything that's created. And I don't like, I don't quite get onto the same page as you do with the way, with the association of colors, but I kind of get it to a degree. Um, and I, I, 
envision of a certain vibe or a certain, maybe it's even a, a bit of a color scheme associated with certain songs. And that might come from an album cover or it might be where I was at that time when I first listened to that song. So if I might've been stuck somewhere in the middle of the city and I just bought a CD and I'm, I'm walking down an alleyway and I'm listening to it as I've just bought it and listening to it on an old Discman or something like that. Um, then that's sort of ingrained. And so whenever I listen to that CD again, I'm, I'm imagining walking down an alleyway in Brisbane when I was 16, listening to Euthanasia by Megadeth. And that was, and so when I hear that, that album now, I'm thinking about certain alleyways and certain, you know, the, the, the lighting in that alleyway, it was darker, it was shady, it was in the afternoon. So there was a, so there was greys around and it was sort of darkish, but there was a certain vibe around it. So you sort of start to get your sensory, the senses that sort of kick in as well. It's not just listening to it from an audible point of view. There's so many other things that come in that sort of paint this, this larger picture. Yeah. And sometimes I'll totally do that on purpose. Like I'll get a new record and I'm like, okay, I want this to be my summer record, so I won't listen to it until I get get to the beach or something nice. like that. You know, and you can kind of, and then whenever you go back to it, you kind of get that. But I've been doing a thing lately where I've been, because, you know, I subscribe to Spotify Premium. It sucks that they don't pay artists, you know, what they deserve, but at least, <laughs> at least it's something and I can feel like I'm not a pirate or whatever by, you know, paying for premium. Yeah. But um, what it's allowed me to do is, not only to listen to new things and stuff, but to go back and catch up on stuff I missed. Mm. Um, you know, I've kind of discovered that there's a whole like era of post punk and like also some kind of nineties alternative band, eighties and nineties alternative bands, like, you know, who's could do and stuff like that, where like every time something pops up that I didn't expect and I'm like, damn, that's, that's great. What is that? It's like, Oh, it's who's could do again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and yeah, it's because I'm, I'm 39. I, I grew up in an era when if you wanted to listen to something, you had to physically be near it. Like yeah. someone had to have the CD or the tape or whatever. Um, you couldn't just pick and choose. So, you know, there were some important bands and stuff that I never heard because no one I knew, you know, had the record and, you know, I lived in a small town and there just wasn't, you know, access to it. I didn't hear Freebird until I was 25, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because no one played it where I was. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... I don't know. I just, um, yeah, I think it's I've a, lost my train. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, I've, I've got Spotify premium as well and, um, I'm not trying to plug it here either, but it's, um, yeah. And the other day, I think Saxon just released their new album and it was such a, cause I've only had it for a couple of months myself. So I'm still getting used to it. And I'm, um, I'm just getting used to the fact that I can skip more than 10 songs and not be uh, blocked and, and restricted from skipping anymore. But, um, <laughs> But I, I saw something on Twitter and Saxon had put a tweet up saying, new album out today. And I thought, oh, I wonder if it's on Spotify. And I looked it up and sure enough, it was there. And literally right on the minute when that, that was released, I could listen to it and I'm listening to the whole album. And I just thought this is incredible. And this is not, you know, going to to a file sharing program and trying to find a torrent and downloading that, that album. It was just, it was there. I just press play and I'm on my way and I'm here I am driving down the highway listening to the, the, the latest Saxon album that the guys in the UK are sitting around just going, well, we're, we're released, we're out. And mm. it was just the most incredible thing. And I did that with, um, with Judas Priest as well with the couple of singles that they just put out. And I just thought, yeah. this is just, um, it's, it's different. And I understand why people, um, are still clinging to the past and, and are very reluctant to, to sort of move with the times. But, um, I think the future is quite bright and I think there's, there's a lot of potential here. And I think it's just a case that we've got to let a lot of the dust settle. And um, I think a lot of more people are going to start to realize what the opportunities are. Cause it's just, uh, it's, it's different. It's very different. It's not the same as what it used to be, but it's just, um, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. It's really, really amazing. Yeah. I have a really odd um, relationship to nostalgia itself because in some ways I'm nostalgic, but often for things that, I didn't live through. Um, yeah. At the moment, I'm kind of obsessed with old Hollywood. I've been watching a lot of movies from like the 30s and 40s. And when I go to LA, I like to visit some of those spots and stuff like that. Um, but I get really disappointed when I hear people. Um, I've actually heard people use the phrase, oh, I used to listen to them when I listened to music. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. 
Or they'll go to, you know, concerts by the bands they liked when they were a kid and they're like, yeah, that totally recaptured my youth. And it's like, well, how about the moment of being there right now? And like, I don't know. I don't go to things to recapture my teenage years because they kind of sucked. <laughs> you know, I was lonely and all I did was play guitar. Um, I kind of, I go to shows now to feel what I feel when I'm there, you know, and I'll go see my old favorites, but I'll go see new bands too. And, you know, there's no reason that you have to just stop listening to music or stop listening to new music at a certain age and say, that was my era, you know, <laughs> um, like, there's always new music. Go find it. Go like, I mean, <laughs> here's, here's a cool example. The band Drunk Moms. Mm. Um, I saw their name once and I was like, oh, what a stupid band. <laughs> Sorry guys, if you're listening. But then I saw them play at the beat Christmas party and I was like, these guys are fucking awesome. And like, you know, it, it's not really anything that I'd normally would have listened to like by choice, but you can't deny when something just moves you emotionally. And I was like, I had the best damn time. Like they're a fun band, you know, they've got some, some cool sounds. They play some cool guitars. Um, they're not in my list of all time favorite bands, but like they made my day better that day. I saw them, you know, in the moment. And that can keep happening. Like now I've got a, my, my son is 11 years old and he's into, um, uh, he's into Paramore. He's getting into Evanescence. He likes David Bowie and Led Zeppelin and Frank Zappa and stuff from hearing them, you know, hearing us play them. Um, it's really cool seeing him develop his personal taste and also take ours on board. And, you know, there are some things we like that he doesn't and that, you know, there are things he likes that we don't like, but it's like, it's cool watching someone else discover music that's relevant to them. And, you know, it can be from any time. Like now, like at 39, I don't need music from 1993 to feel emotionally engaged. It can be something that came out last week. Well, I mean, you, that's the whole thing about being present. You know, you, you're trying to create, you're creating moments as you go, no matter what age you are. And, mm. you know, I mean, I remember, I mean, I, I love, I love my eighties, eighties rock and metal. And I especially love old school Australian classic rock. And I love sort of mm. the 80, 70s and eighties, uh, Australian rock music. And so I'll go out to all these, you know, in quotations, nostalgia shows. And we're like, I'll go with my wife, Jess, and we're clearly like the youngest people in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember one, like we went to see Jimmy Barnes play oh, probably a couple of years ago in Sydney and great show, really good. But you could tell that the demographic and the type of people that were there for the most part, and I shouldn't brush everyone with the same, the same stroke, but um, it was a weekend warrior crowd. It was, you mm. could tell that these were people that probably don't get out very often and were, and you could tell by the way that they received certain songs, you know, if they went back to the old cold chisel or, you know, the classic Barnsley songs, working class man and things like that, then the crowd went absolutely mental. But then when he threw, you know, a song from left field, and I think he was actually playing um, Freight Train Heart in full, which I was just mm. like, I was just bald over. I was just amazed. I was amazed. I was just loving it. Best album. And, um, but he played some of those songs off there that weren't the hits and you can see the crowd just sort of like staring around at the ceiling and sort of, you could see them sort of, you know, daydreaming off and in, in, into the back of the room and, and picking up their wild turkey cans and slamming them down and getting a little bit aggro. And, um, it was just a different vibe because they were there and they were clinging onto the past. They were trying to recapture mm. something from, from when they were in their twenties or in their early thirties. And, and for us, we were just standing up. This is the best. This is so good. But, um, mm. you know, one thing that we do in our band now is that we're trying to find a way that we can, we're not only trying to keep going as a band and create new music, but we're trying to make sure that we're continuing to create these new moments where people can attach to them. Cause I don't know if you've noticed this, but you know, the longer that an album stays out, the more nostalgia that it attaches to it. So people start to show favoritism and bias to an album, the longer that it's been around. So as the years go by, the bias gets more and more attached to an album. So whenever we release a new album, it doesn't matter how good it is. People always go, well, the last album was better than that album. But when you release the previous album, they said, nah, that's not that good. The album before that was better than that one because people are always clinging onto the, to these solid memories that they've attached to the album at that stage. 
And it's a really hard thing because now I'm, I've said to Mark in, in our band, I go, all right, the next album, we've got to make sure that we really sort of punch in between the ages of 17 and 25. If we can get that segment of people, because they're the guys that are just turning into adults, they're becoming legal to drink alcohol, they're getting out there, there's girls, you know, they're going out to gigs, they're partying, they're having a great time, they're getting their first jobs, all these defining moments in their lives. And when they're so impressionable and absorbing all this culture and, and all these experiences around them, you want your music to be there, to be the soundtrack. You want that to just absolutely flood their world. So it attaches to them and becomes such a massive part of their life. So me with the marketing heads ticking over this little sort of mouse in the wheel going, all right, that's what we got to do. That's going to be my target. You know, I'm going to not complete target audience, but I'm going to put a big emphasis on that because that's such an impressionable part of people's lives in that time. But at the same time, our, our demographic for the most part is probably guys in their mid thirties to mid forties. Um, you know, old Maiden fans, old Priest fans. And so we have to hit them and we have to hit them in a way that, you know, is giving them something new, giving them a new moment, a new thing to to create a new memory for them so they can go back in years to come and look back on now and be happy with what they were listening to and what was going on in their life then. So it's, it's a complicated yeah. thing and maybe I'm overthinking it too much, but <laughs> I'm always trying to think of how, how things solidify a moment in our lives and it, and going back to the things such as what you mentioned color um you know and you know it can be smells it can be you know the weather it can be all these different life events and and elements that all capture a moment and music can just be in there as well as a complement to to what's happening yeah well for me like i went through a big period where i was just in the shred guitar and i still love it but I, I got to a point where a lot of it started to kind of melt together for me. And I was like, why, why is this? Like, why do I love this, but I'm not getting satisfied by it anymore? And I realized what it is, is that you have the really inspired guys who play what they play as an expression of who they are. And then you have the guys who are inspired by them. And so that they're, they're trying to recapture the technique or the feel or the excitement or whatever of something they liked, but it's not necessarily honest to them. Um, and so at a certain point you get kind of a whole generation of players who are, you know, there's going to be the great ones and then there's going to be the ones who are so technically minded that their music is about playing guitar. It's not a, it's not using the guitar to express emotion. Yeah, yeah. It's using the guitar to say, listen to me play guitar. Um, Steve, by if I'm going to name drop here for a second, told me this thing once that what he does is when he's playing on stage, like he knows what notes he's going to play his fingers, like he's worked his ass off to make sure his fingers go to the right place. So what he does instead is he will like tell himself a story or just talk out loud, you know, under the roar of the abs, you'll never hear it. But, um, <laughs> you know, and you, you watch him and his mouth moving and yeah. he's just blabbing away. <laughs> and the reason he's doing that is to put his mind on something emotional and tangible instead of, you know, fingers go this way, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, and you know, that to me, like every time I hear Steve by play, like in person, he's better than the time before. Mm. And that's scary. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I really believe it's because if you lead an interesting life, if you, um, you know, if you read a lot, you see a lot of movies, you go out and meet a lot of diff different people, go out and have a lot of different experiences, your music becomes about that instead of about, you know, the theory or the technique that you're using to execute it. It's almost, uh, I don't know if this is right on the money, but it's almost like you spend a period of time in your life where you're trying to, I guess, not master your craft, but trying to get your skills up to a certain, you know, level of competency. And then after that, you go beyond the, the skill set. You go beyond the technicality of what you're doing. And then you try and find this, this higher plane of, you know, a way to connect with other people and connect with yourself. And, and just going back to that Steve Vai example, what his fingers are doing that's in his subconscious he it's big it's um i've been reading this book called um uh i think it's the art of learning by josh waitskin and, mm. and he's like this master chess player and he um 
does uh, push hands tai, uh, tai Chi or something like that. And, um, but he talks about uh, learning numbers to forget numbers. And it's all about just learning the technicalities of what you do and, and going through that process of the, the basic learning. And then once you get up to this competency, you start to f not forget it, but you start to not think about it anymore. It just becomes natural and you're not thinking about it. Cause I've, I've seen myself on stage and I'm playing something and then I'm, suddenly I become so self-conscious of what I'm doing on stage and where my fingers are going on the fretboard that I am guaranteed to fuck up. <laughs> I'm guaranteed yeah. to hit the wrong fret on the wrong string or at the wrong time and in the wrong timing and whatever that is. And I'm guaranteed to stuff up because suddenly everything comes crashing down to this pinpoint moment where I realize, oh my God, I'm on stage, I'm playing right now. And oh, I'm, I'm on this section here and I know right after this, I've got to go here. And then suddenly my hands just go somewhere else. But it's when yeah, I'm running, it's not even thinking about it and I'm looking out in this out in the crowd and I'm connecting with people and I'm smiling at people and I'm having a good time and I'm feeding off the other guys in the band and and finding this other plane of connecting that everything's subconscious and everything just flows and it's this really weird feeling but it's um I guess it's once you get to that point where you just you've, you spent the time you put the hard yards in but now it's it's time to sort of go in a different direction yeah, well, I had this amazing interview with John McLaughlin about 10 years ago where we talked about this. I said, like, what do you think about when you're improvising? And he said, well, you have, it, it's like speaking. When you first begin to speak, you make a few sounds and then you kind of learn to sculpt them into words. And then you start to learn to, you know, read and write. And so you learn the language of that. But when I'm speaking to you now, I'm not thinking ahead. Um, it's all just... The, the process has become so natural that it kind of happens in real time. Mm. And he said, it's the same for me with playing a solo. And, the, you know, a light bulb went off in my head and I was like, there it is. That's it. <laughs> and um, I, I had this thing kick in. Like, I feel like my mind was just waiting for that piece of the puzzle to drop in because once I kind of thought about that, like it just became how I played mm. um, to the point where, I would be playing gigs with my band. I was in this kick-ass band called The Upper Hand for a while. And um, I wouldn't, like, I would learn the songs, but I wouldn't learn the, the strings and fret positions because I started to just think in terms of melody. Mm. And, you know, one gig, I'll, I might play it on this part of the neck, you know, on the lower strings of my seven string, but higher up on the neck. Another gig, I might play it starting on the E string or whatever. Like, just totally, like whatever I felt in that moment because I wasn't thinking in terms of the fingers anymore. I was thinking in terms of the melody mm. and um, that interview totally unlocked that for me. That's cool. I think, um, I think it, I mean, I'm, I'm just reading this book and um, for people listening, I'll put it in the show notes so people can check it out, but it's just, I think it's only just been recent in the last few weeks that I've been reading this and so suddenly same sort of thing where something's just clicked and I've gone, ah, I get it now. I understand. And it's not just about playing music. It's anything when you get into that state of that flow where you don't even know what you're doing. And, and that example of just talking is such a, it's a, it's a perfect example because we, you know, we do so many things on autopilot and it's not so much that it's a bad thing, but it's just become a subconscious skill that we've built up over the years and become great at. And you're able to focus then on other things instead of worrying about the basics of, you know, it's like driving a car, you know, you drive from one side of the city to the other and then you sort of go, how did I get here? <laughs> mm. You know, how did I do this? And, but when you start off driving for the first time, you're looking at everything, you're looking outside, you're looking at the, at the signs, you're looking at the odometer, you're looking everywhere and you're making sure that you've got your pedals and all your feet are doing different things and your hands are doing different things. And you go, how the hell can anybody coordinate all this? And then, you know, fast forward a few years later and, and everything just is working naturally and in unison and in this flow. And it's just the most incredible thing. But I think a lot of us just take it for granted and we just don't understand what that is and why things happen in that way. So yeah, yeah. It's, well, there's this great book called the inner game of music by Barry Green. And, um, he worked with the guy who wrote the inner game of tennis, which a lot of people treat it as a self-help book. Um, and he's kind of tailored this specifically to musicians. And the basic point of it is we put all these barriers in the way between us and a good performance. You know, do I know what I'm going to play? Is the audience going to like it? Is my sound okay? Is my gear okay? <laughs> all this stuff. And once you can kind of uh, just tune that stuff out and they kind of give you some like mental exercises and hints and stuff in the book to kind of 
you know, be prepared, but also be open to the moment. Um, once you can do that, you can do anything. Like I was, um, I've been super lucky to have been asked to jam on stage with both Steve Vai and Joe Satriani at different times. And that's not a natural occurrence, <laughs> you know, um, and you can easily freak yourself out and overthink it and mess up. Um, but my attitude for that whole thing was based on stuff I learned in that book and something my dad told me years ago. Like my dad doesn't play music, but you know, he's a, he grew up around musicians and he's a, he's a smart guy. And, um, one day when I was 14, I was tr sitting on the bed trying to play, um, the solo to crushing day by Joe Satriani. And I was, making a hell of a job of it, just messing up everywhere. And I was getting all frustrated. And so dad walked in and he's like, what's wrong? And I was like, I can't play it. Oh. <laughs> and he's like, well, hold out your hand. Okay. And he's like, how many fingers do you have? Uh, eight fingers and two thumbs. And he's like, what about that Satriani guy? What does he have? Eight fingers and two thumbs. He's like, yep. <laughs> and just like walked out. <laughs> and I was like, aha. <laughs> and, you know, within a week, I'd, you know, finally got the solo and stuff. But, um, you know, flash forward to um, getting invited to jam with Joe and um, I just told myself over and over that this is normal. I play with Joe Satriani all the time. It's just that usually he's on a CD and right now he's in front of me, like completely natural. Yeah, and thinking. so, you know, there's, there's, there's video of it on YouTube and, you know, I started out kind of just, you know, feeling my way around, not trying to get in over my head. But um, after a few little back and forths, I kind of, you know, I was in the groove and I was just having a great time and, you know, it was fun. And then I did it and, you know, Joe seemed to be happy with it. And then, um, again, like in the car on the way home, that's when I freaked out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I had to turn off the music and just like have that moment with myself where I'm like, holy crap, I just did that. <laughs> um, and like, yeah, you can talk yourself into amazing things if you have to, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, standing next to Steve Vai and like harmonizing with him in the moment, like he just locked in, and that's not normal. But even I can do it. Like, <laughs> if I can do it, I, anybody you know, can. <laughs> yeah, and like in my life, I've put up so many obstacles to getting things done. Like, um, you know, I've had like um, depression and anxiety stuff. I've had social phobia stuff. I've always like had these little obstacles to <laughs> you know to succeeding, but even then I've been able to kind of just push through them just with, you know, even if, in my most negative times, I've been able to just rely on the fact that I know how to play music. That's the one thing I can do, you know, reliably. <laughs> and so that's kind of got me through a lot of stuff. Do you think, with, but, um, do you think with that sort of stuff, sorry to cut in, but with, yeah. I guess, just going through some of those challenges that you've had over the years, do you think, because I guess from my experience anyway with the music industry and being around musicians and I mean, we're all, we're all an eclectic bunch. We're all a weird bunch of personalities and we all have our, our things, you know, our own little signature traits. And I guess that's just human nature in general, but I think in music it's, it appears to be more accentuated. It's more visual. You can see it more, but it's, it's a very vulnerable, uh, you know, environment to be in. Um, around musicians, mm. I find I think there's a there's a level of intimidation when you first walk in. Like I'm I'm just having a guess here, but um, possibly when you started, you know, working in music stores and working around people that played music, that there's a level of intimidation where you're sort of looking up to these people and they're knowledgeable, but they're also doing something that you admire. Um, but I think there's this vulnerable feeling that you can potentially get, and I've certainly had this over the years when I've you know, worked my way through various little, uh, I guess my own personal goals of, you know, working in a music store or, you know, starting to play in a band and then starting to do different band goals and associating and talking to different people along the way. And I've certainly had, um, levels of, you know, I probably wouldn't say, you know, big levels of anxiety, but I've had that nervousness and that, uh, hesitation of getting outside my shell and talking to people. But, Sometimes I feel that the music industry and music circles almost force it out of people, I think. Um, I think at, at times you've got no choice because of just that circle and that environment that you're in, that you, you're you so vulnerable that you've got no choice but to express yourself in one form or another. In you know, it's Yeah, well, I think it goes back to what I said about Nam, how everyone has a musician and, you know, you're amongst your people. Like, 
like I said, whatever I, whatever's going on in my life, I know that guitar is the one thing I can do, <laughs> you know? And so I've always kind of had faith that that would, you know, get me through things like whether it's, I'm going through a bad patch and I just, you know, play along to the cure or something like, you know, I find that listening to depressive music when I'm depressed helps because it's like I can compartmentalize my feelings and put them into that music and let them live there. And then I come out of it feeling kind of refreshed, you know? But yeah, I think a lot of musicians have something, you know, buried in them that they're not comfortable with or that holds them back. And the music is kind of how it comes out or how, how they distract themselves from it or, yeah. I mean, I did a, um, a post on my blog about maybe two years ago about some social phobia stuff that I used to have because at one point it got really bad. I couldn't leave the house. And um, one day I went to the doctor and I had a flu or something. And, you know, after the, at the end of the session, like as doctors usually do, they were like, you know, is there anything else you need help with? And it was like some voice from outside of me just blurted out, I'm having panic attacks and I can't leave the house. <laughs> and I was like, oh, who said that? <laughs> um, but that, you know, then my doctor was like, oh, oh, let's talk about this. And so um, they put me on a course of like cognitive behavior therapy and all this stuff. And I eventually kind of worked through it. Um, um, and like, oh man, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> I, um, I, I've seen, I mean... I haven't, I don't think I've ever, well, no, I definitely haven't got to that extreme, but um, mm. I've certainly had those feelings on, on a small scale where um, there's a real reluctance to to be around anybody um, mm. and not, not just because you're feeling antisocial or anything like that, but more of a case of there's a real vulnerability uh, of um, being exposed in a way to other people and feeling that you're being not so much judged, but just all eyes are on you. And there's a spotlight as soon as you walk into a public area. And, and even though nobody's actually facing you, everybody knows that you're there. And there's this, yeah. um, this really sort of odd feeling that's around it. Um, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Well, I'm fine with all eyes being on me if it's on my terms, if I'm on a stage, I'm, really comfortable. Um, but I remembered what my, my point was going to be. Um, so my point was going to be that I wrote this blog post about that a few years ago. Um, and about like the help I've had since then and how like, you know, every 10 years I seem to go through some kind of big depressive episode. And sometimes it comes out in social phobia. Sometimes it's just straight out depression or whatever. But so I wrote this blog post about it and I was amazed at the feedback I got. Like I had everyone from people who've been reading my blog forever to like, some really famous players like just quietly DMing me and saying, dude, me too. And it's just good to know that there's someone else out there who's been through it. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff because like it's still a struggle for me, but I know that hearing others talk about their struggles, um, you know, helps me. So if I can help anyone else by talking about it, like, you know, I'm totally happy to, but yeah, I was really pleased to, to know that I was able to help people just by this blog post. And, you know, it really did hit home to me that everyone's got their own stuff and whatever you're dealing with, like whatever the worst thing you've dealt with is the worst thing you've dealt with. Someone else may have it harder for them and that's their level, but we all have to kind of push through our, our own worst thing that's happened. And, you know, ultimately we're, we're all just people are all just trying to get through the day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, when when you're sort of going through those those harder moments, I mean, you mentioned you know you can always revert back to guitar. Guitar's what you know. It's sort of a safe space for you to be able mm. to you know you've got the confidence there. You've got you know not only memories attached to to it, but you've got a level of comfort that's that's associated with it. But you know using probably putting pushing that aside and even just using the example that you said about talking to other people. Are there other things that you you sort of put yourself through or you try and put yourself through to not because I, I I'd assume that the last thing you want to do is try and fight these feelings that you have, because I think when you sort of put force against force, then you probably have, <laughs> you're probably going to have a catastrophic uh, consequence because of it. But is there, is it, are there things that you've done that have been sort of helpful um, in those times? Um, 
exercise is big. Well, it, it has been big for me. I've gone through periods where I've gone for a run like every morning for a year and a half. Mm. And, you know, I get in shape, but then something happens, twist an ankle or something, and then forget to get back to it for another year, you know. <laughs> but at the times that I'm doing that, it, it feels very beneficial. Um, so, yeah, exercise and going to the gym has been really good. I need to get back into doing that. <laughs> um, yeah. But also, like, just looking for happiness where you can find it. Um, I got to a point where because my entire job is about music and it's also my, you know, my just life passion, I was like, well, I need something else to get into as well. So what, what would that look like? What could that be? And um, the first thing I kind of went to was astronomy. And, you know, I really enjoy astronomy and reading about it and stuff. But then I kind of just... Um, I, I ended up getting into stand-up comedy, like not as a performer, although I'd love to try someday, <laughs> but um, just getting into stand-up comedy and you know, realizing that it's other people expressing their personal truth, you know, in whatever way works for them, which in their case is you know, jokes or funny stories instead of playing guitar. Um, so yeah, whenever I go to LA, like I go to the comedy store like every night. Yeah, um, cool. If you've never been there, like everyone should go to the comedy store and you know, just kind of hang out there. The vibe is so great; it's so much fun, and you know, it's an amazing place. Um, but yeah, so for me, like. I've, you know, whatever else I kind of turn to to kind of cheer myself up is, um, you know, it's, it's either astronomy, comedy, books, you know, um, a good old Netflix binge, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, I guess probably the big thing with this is having, having a variety of different things where you're not putting so much pressure and emphasis on one thing to be the solution to the problem. It's just yeah. keeping the mind active and doing a number of different things that stimulate yourself and not so much, well, I guess it could be a distraction. I guess that's, that's probably half the point, but it's just, I guess, to get the brain moving in a different way and get the body moving in a different way that, that eventually as things, you know, start to, start to, I guess, um, calm down a little bit and, and get, you, there's a bit more control coming back. Um, you know, you've, you, you've, you've been immersing yourself in other, other different things along the way. Yeah. Well, sometimes I feel like it's, <laughs> this is really silly, but it, it's like, it's all balloons. And sometimes the depression balloon gets overinflated. So you might need to kind of blow up the comedy balloon or the Star Wars balloon <laughs> to an equal <laughs> size. Yeah. <laughs> And then everything kind of balances out, you know. Uh, absolutely, I think I think when I when I look at um, you know, times that I've certainly struggled, I've realised that um, my scope or um, you know what I'm looking at as far as you know where, where I am in my life and what I'm doing is so it's it's almost tunnel vision. I'm focusing mm. way too much on one thing and or one or two things, and it's just it's too it's too small. It's too small of a scope and. And that's where all the pressure and the anxiety and, and that overwhelming feeling kicks in. And you, and you, you start to have these irrational thoughts about, you know, this is all my world is, this is everything. And, mm -hmm. and if that world is not right, then everything's not right. And then it sort of, it snowballs and it gets worse and worse. And, um, one mm -hmm. thing that I've certainly had benefit from, from, you know, the last several years is just doing a million different things. Sometimes it bites me on the ass because I do too much and I stretch, stretch myself out, but it's been so good for my mental health where I'm always, I've always got something on the go. There's something different happening and I've got something coming from every direction and, and it can get overwhelming at times, but it keeps me stimulated and keeps me enthusiastic and driven. And sometimes it can get a bit too much, but I, I think it mitigates the chances of me having that point where I go, oh my God, everything's falling apart and, and things are just not going, going well in general. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm keeping, I, I could talk to you for hours <laughs> I'm looking at, <laughs> and I'm looking at the time, but I, I really wanted to cover one more thing and, um, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll let you get back to your Saturday night, but, um, you've been a music journo for so many years and, mm -hmm. And going back to your first few jobs working in music stores, did you did you have an inkling even back then that you wanted to be sort of working in that sort of facet in 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 sort of a journalistic way with music, or was it something that just sort of naturally came later on down the track where an opportunity popped no. up and you thought, "I'll oh, stuff it, I'll give it a go." 
when I was 11, I saw my first copy of Guitar World magazine and I was like, I've got to do that. Oh. I've got to be a part of that. I don't even know how it's going to happen. But, you know, now I've written for Guitar World. I've seen my byline in there and it's like, yep, I did it. <laughs> even, <laughs> yeah, I, I somehow pulled it off. But, um, yeah, no, I've always, I always just wanted to be a part of that world. So the first opportunity I got was um, uh, BMA magazine in Canberra when I was at uni. I mm. went to uni in Canberra amazing metal scene there by the way like yeah. at the time there was like Alchemist and Henry Zanger and all those guys great band <clears throat> but um yeah so I started just doing CD reviews and interviews for BMA and um then in my third year at uni I was news and reviews editor for the student magazine and then I just kind of built from there and um you know after a while you start to kind of get referred to jobs by other people and you know it all just kind of if you can be consistent and do good work, then it just kind of builds. And um, I think if anyone's interested in doing music journalism, I would say do as much as you can um, on your own, like, you know, blogs and things like that, if you, if you want to do that. Um, and, you know, if, if there are sites that take reviews for free, do that, promote the hell out of what you've done. And then once people start paying you for your work, don't don't work for free again. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. as soon as you get in there, like it can, you can make a living off it. It's not always a huge living, but you can make a living off it if you value it enough that you don't let other people devalue it. Mm. Um, you know, I turned down heaps of work where people are like, "Hey, we can't pay you, but we'll pay you in publicity," and it's like, "Well, <laughs> I've I've got that now." Like, you know, I've reached a point in my career where. You know, people in the industry know who I am and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, my blog's got a lot of readers. I've got a lot of social media followers and stuff. I don't need, um, you know, a site with 2,000 followers to, you know, give me free publicity. <laughs> like, you've got to value yourself enough to say that, no, what I do is worth being paid for. Um, so, yeah, what what happened is um, I started writing for uh, mixed down in about 2005 and then Australian guitar followed after that. Then I started the blog and then, uh, Seymour Duncan saw my work, Gibson.com saw my work and I used to write to them for a while. Um, I've done stuff for premier guitar, blunt. I do the weekly metal column in beat magazine. Um, you know, and basically if you, if you just always put yourself out there to take the work, um, you can, you know, you can get a lot done. Um, I know there are some magazines I've written for where they have a big pool of writers and a lot of them are kind of younger and will just only take the, the interviews that they can brag about basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's like, it's like, well, I get it. But also like, if you're serious about it, then everything you write makes the next thing better. And everything you learn about makes your life better. So if you have to interview someone about a, a dog show or something, you know, do that. <laughs> you know? Uh, whatever the whatever the article is, you know, you can always learn something from it. And if it's paid, then what have you got to lose? You know, well, that's it. But uh, I think it's almost like uh, you know, instead of focusing on the name associated with your work giving you the leverage rather than the quality of your work making something out of something that might not be a big deal to begin with so you know using that that example of the dog show actually writing an amazing piece that's really interesting and and uh, engaging engaging for something that most people would not really care much for and that's a demonstration mm. of what your actual skill is rather than you just relying on the big name to to give you that sort of push yeah, well, I see a lot of people who, it used to be that you you did things, you know, maybe work experience or like, you know, uh, free articles for a magazine. You did them for the experience, meaning you did them to put them on your resume and build to a career. And it seems that there's a, a lot of people who now do them for the experience of having done it. And they're not really thinking of where it's going to lead to next. And so they're, they're picking and choosing, like, what do I want to do because it's fun? It's like, well, sometimes you've got to have discipline and just do something because you realize that you need to eat that week. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good point because I, I know a lot of guys that um, – and people that listen to this podcast as well that uh, have either been in that sort of music journalism world or are still aspiring to and, and look – 
uh, for opportunities and are trying to work it out and trying to find their feet and where they fit into it all. And I see it so many people where they do great work and they're writing all the time, um, but they've they've got to a point where they just don't know how to break into that next sort of, or break into that next thing to, or get up to that next level where either they, they're getting to what you said before, where you get to a point where you can, you no longer do free work um, or they're spending too much time just cherry picking certain things that they focus their work on rather than just, you know, going in and really sort of demonstrating what their capabilities are. And um, it's, well, yeah. One of the things you can do is a lot of people will just send stuff to an editor and say like, you know, hey, here's something I did for such and such, and such a website. Um, can I write something for you guys? And the editors get like a million of those a day. What, What's better is to say, hey, I've got this great idea for an article and you, you pitch the article. You don't need to have actually done it yet, but if you show that you have solid ideas and present a list of them, you know, the ideas, um, you're much more likely to get um, a response, get a commission, whatever, um, because you're not just showing that I've done this in the past, I can do it again for you, just tell me what, what to write about. You know, they want a point of view that fits with the magazine, but that maybe they didn't think of yet, <laughs> you know? Mm. So yeah, um, don't be afraid to pitch article ideas and just write them down. I have like hundreds of article ideas written down and, you know, whenever I feel like, oh, um, I need some more, <laughs> some more freelance clients, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, send a few of those out and, you know, you get a few bites and off you go. <laughs> just thinking about some of the things that you've written over the years and probably some of the more, I guess, pivotal, one, pivotal ones where, you know, they sort of really sit in, in your mind. Um, were there certain things that you sort of see as far as a link between those, the pieces that you're most proud of as far as the way you wrote them? Is there something there that has an essence that um, people should keep in mind when they're putting together, you know, an article or writing a piece? Mm, I don't know. I, I, I try to bring the same kind of approach to everything I do. Um, and, like, if I don't like a band, I don't let on in the interview or the article, you know, because that's not my place to mm. be like, you know, oh, this, these guys suck, I guess we've got to interview them, though. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I try to look for whatever whatever the spark is that makes people like them. I kind of speak to that. But, um, you know, I've had some interviews over the years that, you know, like the John McLaughlin one kind of changed my life personally as a guitar player. Um but yeah, like I've interviewed some great people over the years, Tony Iommi, Buddy Guy. That that was incredible because he he doesn't seem to understand that he's Buddy Guy. Like he sees himself as some guy who plays the blues and he's really flattered that people want to listen. And it's like, no, dude, you're Buddy Guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, Dave Mustaine's always a great interview, Joe Satriani, Steve Vai. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's, I've had so many great conversations that, have you know turned into articles that people have enjoyed and stuff but they also like they help me as a person and as a, a player as well so like i'm stupid crazy lucky to be doing this stuff because like yeah to get that kind of access to these people and then kind of fold it into your own personal development is like you know and i think that's why people like podcasts so much lately is that just hearing people have a conversation and engaging on a deeper level you know, you feel like you're a part of the conversation too. Like yeah. I'll listen to Dean Del Rey or Mark Maron's podcast and it's almost like I want to hit pause and say, yeah, but guys, have you thought about... <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, I do that all the yeah. time on Twitter. I'm listening to some, mm. a couple of people talk and I'm suddenly like tweeting them mid-conversation that they're having and, and the, 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 the episode was probably from six months ago and they're like, what, what are you on about? <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it's um, it's it's certainly an amazing medium and, I mean, even... I know that you've got your podcast as well. And mm. I think what I've discovered over the years of doing that is it's just a, it's a completely different monster. It's, it's a completely different way of connecting, not only with the person that you're speaking to, you know, either face to face or like we're doing over the phone, but um, having, you know, us talk and then I at least have that feeling that other people are hanging around and listening as well. And I know that eventually they will when this goes to air, but it's just this really cool feeling where it's, it's, it becomes a community thing and people are really sort of taking 
taking notice of what's going on and then you know mm-hmm. and i guess that's probably an advantage over some of the more some of the written media where people will read that as they're doing other things or as they're traveling or doing different things and you know that you sometimes you have to stop in your tracks to read it and and try and take it in without distraction and some people struggle with that but um mm. you know listening to people's voices and, and listening to different textures and tones um it's 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 a different world it's really really fascinating yeah, I'm having a great time doing my podcast. Like, I'm only about, I think, 13 episodes in so far. I've got a few more recorded and you know, a bunch more about to happen. Um, but, like, because I've got this archive of interviews going back 20 years, like, I've got a tape of me interviewing Peter Steele from Typo Negative oh, in wow. 1999. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I've got all this stuff. I've got stuff going back, you know, decades with, you know, some of these players aren't with us anymore and, you know, some of them went on to kind of bigger things or some of them it might have been kind of their peak, you know. There's all sorts of stuff. Like I've kept every interview I've ever done and that's a lot at this point. So <laughs> so yeah, I'm kind of mixing archival things and new things and yeah. That's awesome. And I've looked at the list of um of guests that you've had on for your first few episodes and I thought, oh geez, yeah, you really um you really setting the bar high <laughs> to begin with. But I mean that's, yeah, years, well, that's years of you you working your butt off and having, you know, this this network of amazing people that you built connections with. Yeah. Well the most recent episode is with um Roger Mayer who was Jimi Hendrix's guitar tech. Mm. And that guy's got some stories, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's really cool. But yeah, so, you know, at first I was trying to have like maybe three or four interviews that are like 15, 20 minutes long. But um, I noticed that people seem to respond more to the longer conversations like Roger and like um, John Sullivan from Sully Guitars. Um, So I'm going to kind of alternate, I think, between the shorter interviews and, you know, long form ones and just kind of, you know, see what the podcast wants to be. Absolutely. I think that's, that's something that I certainly had to go through and it took me took me a long time and I think even now I don't know what episode I'm up to now 114 or something like that and mm. I think I'm still trying to work it out and I still like I find myself going off in a different direction and I come back and I go somewhere else and I think the OC, OCD side of me doesn't like it but at the same time the thing that sort of keeps me at ease is understanding that there's no rules to this at all like I'm not mm. controlling it and I do whatever the hell I want and yep. people respond to it and and sometimes you you hit it and you get a great reaction from people and other times you don't and you get and it's it's a it's a dust ball flying across the across the road and there's just nothing happening <laughs> and you go oh well okay that didn't work I'll, I'll try something else next time but that's the cool yeah. thing about it is that you can you can experiment and try different things and I think that's so cool that you've got all this archived you know content that's sitting there and you can mix it in and and give people a bit of a a flashback a time capsule of of where even not even just about the guests but where you were what you were doing Mm. and and your story and and people learn more about you you know the presenter and the host of of the podcast rather than just the guest and the name being associated with whatever episode it is and i think people really gravitate towards that and really respond well and and are very intrigued and connect more with you because they can see your journey they can see you know i'd I'd love to hear that peter Steele one and not so much because it's peter Steele and he's no longer with us but to hear how you approached that interview and how you spoke to him and the type of questions you asked him back then versus Mm. the way that you would have that same sort of conversation now with with another musician and i think that'd be really really intriguing yeah definitely i mean the one of the one of the best lessons I've learned as an interviewer came from listening to Mark Maron podcasts a lot, and that is that asking someone, "So who are your influences?" is like the <laughs> stupidest, wor- worst question you can ask. Oh, I still do that but, every once in a while. <laughs> but no, no, no. But once you've got into like you know a, a good conversation and built a rapport, you know, over the course of the interview, um, once you've gotten into it, if you ask, like, so who were your dudes? Who were your guys? Who were your, you know, who, who was big for you or whatever? Asking it in that way, once you've built a rapport, you get like a much deeper answer than if you just said, who were your influences early on? Like, <laughs> it, it's a lazy question when you're asking it to a stranger. But once it's someone that you've even been talking to for 15 minutes um, and they've got a sense of, you know, the, the feel of who you are and that stuff, you can get some really cool stuff. Like, I feel like who are your influences is a boring question, but who got you excited about playing 
is a great one mm. um, when asked in the right way at the right time because the answer is usually totally different to what an influence is. Um, but yeah, ultimately, like the whole point of interviews, it's all about a connection and then presenting that connection to the readers and having them feel like they are part of the conversation too. Oh, I'm still, I'm still uh, working, working that one out. But um, I've, I've seen, um, I've definitely had my trial, trials and errors along the way, and um, it's, it's really interesting. And I find it fascinating because I haven't come from that, that journalistic background, that journalist background, and, and so I've really sort of, and I think people that have been listening to this for the last few years have, um, have watched me stumble and fall at different times and say the most ridiculous and dumb things and <laughs> cringeworthy moments along the way. But um, I guess the great thing about what I do is that I just try and keep it as raw as possible and just let it all hang mm. out. And and when it sometimes it's even better when it crashes and burns because it it's actually <laughs> more entertaining. <laughs> There's a better story yeah. that comes from it. And it depends. <laughs> and it's great to hear a reaction from the other side as to how they handle it as well. And um, I think my next challenge is uh, I think I will probably go down the path of not so much going on the, the stock standard PR media lists because I've done that in the past for uh, some web zines back in the day and um, I think they can be they can be um, you know hit and miss because you know you're, you're sitting on the phone waiting and you can be the 20th person and you know the, the 19 people before you've asked the same questions over and over and you've got to try and be different and amazing and that person just wants to get off the phone and mm. And for me, my podcast is usually, you know, 45 to an hour, hour plus, depending on, on, you know, the guest. And so these people usually have, you know, 15 minutes or something like that. So it's like, well, how do you build rapport? How do you, how do you build that connection really quickly? How do you get them engaged and get them really connected and, and talking? And, and I think, um, I think that'll be my next, my next goal. And, it, and just, yeah, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do it because I really love the way that I do it now. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm intrigued to see how other people do it and, and how people are able to get the best out of other people when they talk to them. Well, I think for starters, just disarming them at the start. Like one thing you'll hear me say a lot if it's a podcast interview that's been previously used for a magazine and they, you know, let me use the audio for the podcast is I'll tell people like, hey, this is for a guitar magazine, so I hope you don't mind some nerdy guitar talk and you know, stuff like that. And you kind of let them know the tone of the interview to start with because yeah. a lot of these guys never get to talk guitar you know they get asked all these stupid questions and they never get to talk about the thing they really love so for me i've been really lucky getting to like when i interviewed slash at the end of the interview he was like thank you so much for that because <laughs> i never get to talk this stuff people just want to know about what you know this was like 10 years ago he's like you know people just want to know what happened between you and Axel and blah 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 yeah. and he's like I never just get to talk about crybabies and you know, <laughs> Les Pauls and stuff so it's, yeah um, just basically just finding something that will you know spark them a little bit um, often before an interview I'll like jump on YouTube and kind of just get a bit of a sense for who someone is like watch it and watch another interview with them and get a sense of how they talk, you know, are they very engaging or are they more of a yes or no answer kind of person? And just kind of try and find something in my research that will kind of get them excited. And once once you've kind of got them pumped up, then, you know, you can get a great interview. And if you just do it too by the book and you've just got questions written down and you're just trying to hit them, it's going to suck because they're not going to feel, you know, like it's a conversation. They're going to mm. feel like it's a Q&A. Yeah. And that's never fun. No, not at all. Not at all. I've been on, I've been on the other end of that, and <laughs> mm. it, it can be very, um, very stale and, and tedious. And um, yeah, and but yet, you know, I, I, at least from my end, I, I, I have to do them. But um, yeah, it can be, it can be very. Uh, it's it's hard f to remember those those types of interviews and conversations because they're never a conversation. It becomes this stale, mm. tedious. Uh, sort of robotic thing that you go through. So, um, yeah, absolutely. And that's something that maybe I've put, I've been very, very conscious of. And sometimes I've been reluctant to reach out to certain people because I've been so fearful of, of falling into the trap of a Q and a type question or bringing up a topic that would be brought up previously and not articulating it in a way that's fresh and, uh, something that will actually get their attention and, and them wanting to, or inviting them to, to have a good conversation. So, I mean, that's, that's well, uh, that's a, that's a journey that I'm still on, though. Yeah. Well, a while back when um, Motley Crue were doing their final tour, um, I had an interview with Tommy Lee, and we were told going into it, 
no questions about his personal life. Just keep it to music. <laughs> and, you know, otherwise the interviews will be called off, which is fair enough. Like when you get to that level, like you don't want to deal with bullshit and yeah. you deal with it a lot. Yeah, <laughs> um, and then like, you know, I got a call uh, prior to my interview slot saying uh, someone asked him about his personal life and he hung up and we're trying to get him to agree to do the interviews again. But seriously, no, no personal life questions. And I was like, <laughs> dude, it's me. I'm not going to ask any of that stuff. I'm going to ask him about recording with Stu Ham. I'm going to ask him about his signature Schecter guitar that he had a while back. I'm going to ask him about his approach to guitar in general because we normally think of him as a drummer. Mm. I'm going to ask him about Smashing Pumpkins and all this stuff, you know, as well as the Motley Crue thing that the the tool, the interview was to promote. Mm. And again, like he friggin' loved it because he, like, you know, he said too that he never gets to talk about this stuff. And, you know, it was one of the most fun interviews I've ever done. And, Again, one of those ones where, like, Tommy Lee is, like, a level of fame that's above many of the people I interview. But he was so chill and so happy and relaxed just to be able to talk about this stuff and become, like, a kid again, just nerding out about his favorite music and software and all this stuff, you know. It's just, again, it's just all about connection. That's cool. Okay, well, before before I wrap it up, because I'm really, mm -hmm. um, I'm now I'm getting paranoid. I'm like, I'm keeping, I'm keeping Peter. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to know really quickly. So, I mean, you've you've interviewed so many people over the years. Is there somebody that stands out as, I guess, the best or the most memorable person that you've ever spoken with? Um, and is there somebody else that you've just was an absolute train wreck? <laughs> um. Uh, you know what, the answer to both, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, is Dave Mustaine. Oh. Um, Dave's, Dave's a great guy. I've been able to work with him through Seymour Duncan. And he's done some of the best interviews that I've ever done. And then there was one where you could just tell that like, he had other stuff going on and you know, he was busy. He didn't really you know, feel like doing press that day. Whatever it was, like, you, you could just feel that his heart wasn't in it. Mm. And then I was like, well it's my job to turn this around because this is my time with him. I've got to get an article out of it. And so again, we just started talking guitar gear and, you know, he perked right up and we got a great interview, but the, you know, initially it was like, Oh geez, <laughs> you know, this, this one's not going well, but yeah, he's a great guy, a lot of fun to work with. And, you know, he's going to be in my podcast soon. And, you know, when he's like, a guy like that, like he's so intelligent that you really want to keep him engaged. Um, and so, yeah, like he's, when he wasn't feeling it that day, it was actually the day of the government shutdown a few years ago. Uh, and I think his eye was on the news, <laughs> you know, yeah. and not, not on uh, doing interviews. But yeah, no, so he, he's been, you know, one of the best. Um, but generally, like everyone is a great interview except for brand new bands who are just starting out, you know, and they're always a little bit too big for their boots, and, yeah. you know, but then they chill out and a few years later, they're really cool. So it's all good. Is there, is there somebody that's on your, your bucket list or on your radar that you haven't had the chance to talk with yet and you would absolutely love to, is there, is there one per person in particular that uh, you just haven't been able to quite get to yet? Well, uh, there's a couple, uh, Eddie Van Halen, uh, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. And out of those three, the big one for me would be Robert Plant. Mm. Um, as much as I'm a huge Eddie fan and a huge Page fan, I've got a Led Zeppelin tattoo on my arm. Um, for me, like the way Robert Plant has like built a career since that Led Zeppelin, that he never tries to recapture what he did. Like if you go and see him in concert, he will play Black Dog. But the only thing that, carries over from the Zeppelin version that's basically the lyrics. <laughs> you know, he will t turn it into its own song um, with the band that he has now, with the person he is now. And it'll be, it'll be different from one tour to the next, a whole new arrangement. And I, I love that. Like, I don't need to see him go back to Zeppelin again and do a reunion, you know, a full reunion tour or anything like that. Like, I just want him to be the happy artist that he is. And I want to talk with him about that stuff. That's cool. Well, hopefully it can happen. Yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, he'll be in, in town soon, so yeah. I'll be pulling some strings and trying to make that happen. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be keeping an eye out and uh, cheering from the sidelines if I see it pop up. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, look, 
I'm going to let you go. I, I've, I had a list a mile long here and I haven't even touched half of it, but I think we've covered, <laughs> I think we've covered quite a bit. And, um, and I think uh, maybe next time I'm in Melbourne, if you're there, then uh, we should catch up sometime and have a have a chat because there's um, I'm really really fascinated with a lot of the stuff that you've done over the years and what you do and and I think just um, seeing you get into podcasting now and 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 on the back of so much content and so much experience that you've had over the years in the industry, it's just really really intriguing to see somebody that really has an art form when it comes to talking to different musicians networking working in the music industry working with established and you know some of the greatest brands in the world um yeah it's just something that i'm really really fascinated about so i think i could chew your ear off for, for hours on end <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure and if anyone wants to hit me up on twitter i'm at my heart guitar and i'm always happy to nerd out about stuff anytime sounds good i'm going to put everything in the show notes as well so people can go and check that out also but uh cool peter Thank you very much. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday night and uh, we'll chat Thank soon. Thank you. <laughs> Tom, thanks right. very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to reach out to Peter, as with any of the guests that have been on the Andy Social Podcast, you can go to andysocial.net, click on the show notes for this episode. I will have all of Peter's contact details, all of his social media handles, uh, a link to his blog, iheartguitarblog.com, and... Uh, links to everything we spoke about in this episode so everything will be over there as per usual and um as peter mentioned in the episode as well if you want to reach out to him talk shop talk about anything uh, i'm sure that he is more than willing to have a chin wag with you guys and at least from my side being the broken record that i am i really really encourage you guys to reach out to any and all of the guests that have been on the Andy Social podcast to date, those guys sacrificed a lot of time to be on this podcast. And uh, I think it'd be really cool if uh, you guys, if you've got a spare couple of minutes, flick them a quick message and let them know what you thought. And I would love you a long time. All right, guys, before I wrap it up, as always, if you want to support this podcast, you can go over to andysocial.net, click on the shout me a beer button, which takes you over to paypal.me. You can click uh, click, you can click if you want. Uh, you can flick over a few cents, a few dollars, and uh, that will go towards a bit of beer money because, you know, the less money of my own that I spend on beer, that's more money that I can spend on the podcast. I think that's good logic, isn't it? It's a bit of a roundabout way of supporting the podcast. So you can go over to andysocial.net and go and do that. Um, but if you want to just support the podcast in general, the fact that you guys are listening to me ramble on means a hell of a lot. Uh, you can leave reviews on Facebook, iTunes, um, and your preferred podcast player, where Wherever there's a place to review it, just leave a review. Let me know if you've left a review somewhere uh, in the nether regions of the internet. And, uh, you know, sharing, liking, retweeting, commenting, tagging, you know, all that social media stuff, you know, the drill. Um, all that stuff means a hell of a lot. So thank you so much to everybody that continues to support the podcast. Really, really appreciate it. Means a hell of a lot. And, uh, yeah, that's enough. All right. Until next week, take care, guys. It's